let's get to the reason we're all here tonight to hear from Rich Mirnov. I've uh, been happy to know Rich for a while now. Um, he's a product management coach and consultant. He was the product guy at Six Silicon Valley Startups. He's the author of the book that we gave away, The Art of Product Management, which is one of the earliest books in product management. Um, you can check out his helpful blog at Mirnov.com. And again, his Twitter handle is at Rich Mirnov. And he's going to be covering with us, sharing some advice on a topic that we haven't really heard much about here at Lean Product Meetup, but is very, very important for product teams, which is how to manage misaligned stakeholders. So I'm really excited to welcome Rich. Thanks, Dan. And, and just to frame this up, you know, I, I'm a coach for heads of product. I sometimes drop into companies as the interim VP or CPO. Uh, you know, if you've been following my stuff, you know that I write a lot about organizational issues across functional or departmental lines. So, you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about not the details of how we're going to size a particular story, but how we're going to get the VP of sales and the VP of marketing in the right place so we can get the right things done, even though they don't agree. And, and so the, uh, the headline here, of course, is how to manage misaligned stakeholders. Nearly every place I've been, I discover that the stakeholders are misaligned. So that'll be the, the topic. And we'll be talking a lot more about organizations and psychology and biases than we are about algorithms. So just so you know, that's coming. So normally when I have the prioritization discussion with particularly individual contributor product managers or folks who've recently moved up into this sort of director level job, they all want to talk about algorithms and spreadsheets and tools. And I think those are great, but mostly what I see at, at the executive level, at the hard problem level, it's not about algorithms. It's not about having the right template or how many columns go in the spreadsheet and how we weight them. It turns out, in my view at least, to be mostly the real issues around either unaligned or misaligned departments, a, a lot of sampling bias on the part of the various executives we're going to be working with. And if we peel that back and we come back to the sort of fundamental product management skills, you know, we would never launch a product without having spent a lot of time thinking about our users, what they need, what their problems are, how they view the world, how we're going to frame up positioning or benefits or arguments so that we get to the right place. And then we can talk about features. And so we're going to apply some of those same tools, the same thinking, but we're not thinking about end users who pay us money here. We're going to be thinking about the executives and leaders through your company and how they think or behave. Because when we understand a little bit more about how they think, we're going to be able to do a better job of figuring out how to realign or, or handle the prioritization problem. So watch for that. Good. So let's step through. So here, here's my opening thoughts, which, of course, no surprise, we're going to echo at the end as takeaways. It's my observation that in most companies, the various departmental stakeholders are in fact misaligned. They're lobbying against each other. It's, it's the nature of the jobs they do. And so we're gonna take those jobs apart a little bit and ask what the, the biases or alignments are for each of those groups, right? Um, second thing I note is that all these requests come in and everybody wants a single metric to measure all things, right? It's ROI or it's how much money we're gonna make this quarter. And, I've never gotten that to work because it turns out that stories or demands or requests or whatever we're going to call them come in a bunch of different shapes and they're really hard to compare to each other. So we're going to unpack that a little bit. Third one, what this leads to, and, and we'll get to it later, anybody who's been through my pie chart exercise will see this familiar, but I'm going to suggest that we have to decide at a high level how much attention we're going to give or how much engineering time we're going to give to various groups before we get stuck in the individual tickets, the individual requests, the individual stuff. Because once everybody's got all their emotions riding on some particular request for some customer, it's too late to really solve the problem. And then the fourth one here, and, and I think we've all been here, but we try not to say it, but we're all product folks, so I can say it with just our little audience. Nobody will know. I routinely expect my stakeholders to forget what we decided, to disagree with the choices we made, and especially to fight like heck against or choices. Right? I haven't met a CEO or a VP of sales who believes in the existence of the words exclusive or. They only believe in the existence of the word and. As in, I know we have a bunch of things in the uh, pipeline and a bunch of things on the roadmap and a bunch of things committed and 
I need this one more tiny little thing. By the way, they almost always attach the phrase, it's really going to be easy. How hard can it be? I bet it's only 10 lines of code. And perhaps we've already promised it to a customer. Right. Uh, for background, by the way, I come mostly out of the enterprise world where big deals drive executives to do all kinds of things that we might not prefer that they do, but here we are. Okay, so that's our opening thoughts. Let's jump in and, and let's start with the, the, uh, the second problem actually, which is that things come in different shapes and they're hard to compare. So uh, anybody who doesn't recognize that, that's a bucket. And we're going to create a few buckets in our little uh, allocation scheme here so we can put different things in the places they go. Because the challenge we have is that we're always trying to make trade-offs between things that aren't alike. We've got a little tiny white space in next sprint, and we're trying to decide if we're going to fix a bug or add a major feature or a minor feature or do some extra testing, right? Those don't go together. Uh, when we've got a customer that's pushing us for something very special and weird and unique like an integration, but we're planning to do a bunch of user experience or workflow changes, those are really hard to compare because they don't work on the same units or timeframes, right? And the idea that we're going to assign dollars or actually choose your currency unit, right? Euros or pounds or yen or whatever they are, that we can evaluate everything in our backlog on a strict ROI dollar basis, you know? It just doesn't work that way. I've Now, maybe somebody here is way smarter than I am, but I've never gotten that to work. So I'm going to suggest we turn this on its side a little bit. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a few different buckets or categories, or since I'm going to use pie charts, I'll call them slices. And we're going to put all the visible features that customers really ask for by name in one slice or bucket. And we're going to put all the bugs and tech debt and architecture in another slice or a bucket, right, et cetera, so that we can evaluate things against similar items and make good choices. In fact, we're going to try to enlist our various stakeholders in helping us make good choices by restricting the choice set and keeping them in one slice or bucket. Right? This is, notice this is all about psychology. It's not about spreadsheets and tools. Okay, so let's take a look at that pie chart. And um, some of you may know this, certainly it's, it's something I share widely. There's something magical about pie charts when we're trying to educate our executive teams about it, about any kind of thing. The magic thing about pie charts versus say bar, ch bar charts or some other chart is you can't make one of the slices bigger without making one of the slices smaller. This would seem obvious to product folks, but it's not obvious to a lot of executives. So we're going to try to set up a, a, an allocation or an investment portfolio here in the same way that if we were investing our uh, retirement money, you know, if, if you're doing this right, you got, you know, 60% stocks and 40% bonds or the other way around, you know, maybe some um, socially responsible funds and, you know, foreign things and startups or whatever. The way we do that is before we get hypnotized by any one stock or bond or company, we figure out what our strategy is. So we're gonna do the same thing here. Uh, this is a pie chart, it's generic and, and I've taken off all the percents, but you could probably guess. And it's how I think of the typically well-run enterprise software SaaS company. So not airlines, not banks, but if you're building enterprise software as your product, I'm hoping it looks a little bit like this. So the green slice, is all the things that customers actually ask for by name. They put in a ticket, they want a new workflow, they want to move a button, they need an integration to some special database, whatever, whatever. All the things that customers ask for by name go into the green slice. And notice cleverly, we're only going to spend roughly half of our energy on that, whether you're measuring, I don't know, engineer days or story points or strawberries, or I don't care what you measure it in, right? We're going we're gonna to limit ourselves, if we can, to roughly half of the spend on things that are going to be visible to customers. We're going to reserve most of the rest, that's the red slice, for all the things we have to do to actually stay in the software business that customers assume we're going to do without asking. Right? If, if your SaaS applications ever run out of capacity or couldn't do a transaction for a customer or was offline or got hacked, well, we didn't really expect them to open tickets and remind us to have enough scalability. So the red stuff is everything that we and our engineering team have to do to actually stay in the software business. 
Usually we just call those illities, right? You can fill in whatever you want. Bug fixes quality, right? The bottom slice, the dark blue slice is a little tiny one, but it's the energy we put into validation or experiments. I know Dan likes MVP. I don't use that uh, acronym anymore, but here's all the learning. Here's all the interviews. Here's all of the going out and finding out what's true in the world. And then because I'm thinking enterprise, that gray slice at the top turns out to be some small number of things that huge deals demand and that the CEO overrules us on and tells us we have to do. Right? Um, if you're in a, a B2C company, you may not see this because you've got 100,000 or 100 million customers, none of which is big enough to matter that they're going to call your CEO and, and get the uh, roadmap changed. But in the enterprise business, this happens almost every week. And, and my observation is that if that unplanned deal-driven stuff that, by the way, is crowding out whatever we plan for the quarter, for the sprint, whatever, when that gets a, above 10 or 12 or 14%, honestly, the whole business goes downhill because we discover that we're not a software product company anymore. We're a custom development shop for our five biggest customers, right? So we're, we're gonna set this up. This is a pie chart, not a roadmap. So the roadmap items are gonna come out of this, but we're really just looking to divide up the problem so we can then talk with the people who matter. Okay, so there's a little bit of theory. Let's hit the, uh, the bias and the psychology and the lenses. So I'm gonna take apart a few departments and, and just for clarity, I'm oversimplifying, I'm making this up. Uh, your company may not be different from this, but it may look familiar. So let's take a few departments just for fun. Right. So sales. And I don't know what she's selling, although there's a Trello picture on her screen. So who knows? Right. But here's somebody from your sales team. Let's unpack a little bit about what they do and what their biases are, what their lenses are. And when I say lens, I'm thinking about two things. One is inevitably everybody in your company has some sampling or selection bias because they talk to different subsets of the world. Right. And they focus on different problems, right? So their lens is how to get the thing done that they're paid to do. Most salespeople, and again, I'm thinking enterprise here, but you know, extend as you like, the lens they have is the most recent call they were on or the most recent sale they lost or the most recent objection that came from a customer. And that's heavily weighted by how big the customer is, right? Um, why do I know this? I know this because, um, Coffee's for closers, and if you close, you get a bonus and a promotion, and, a, and a, you hit quota, and you get a big check, and you buy a new Tesla. And if you don't hit quota, you get fired, right? So salespeople are strongly motivated by the specific accounts or the specific customers they're working on. And if they're enterprise salespeople, <clears throat> excuse me, they may only have four deals they're working this quarter. So rather than believing that the salespeople are sampling the whole world and know what's happening, what we're getting from each of the salespeople is a couple of instances of a couple of customers who are big and probably unique, right? The other bias, of course, is current quarter revenue. It's not money for this current quarter. Honestly, from a sales point of view, who cares, right? So the words we usually hear from them and choose your own, right? Gosh, this missing feature lost the deal. By the way, I've never met a salesperson who told me that we lost the deal for bad salesmanship but most of the deals we lose turn out to be assigned to a missing feature, right? And the other one we get either from the renewal team or the new sales team is some big customer that's threatening to churn, whether or not it's true. Uh, if we don't promise to put something on the roadmap that they, they either say they want or might think they need, right? So it's not that the salespeople are wrong. It's that when we think about who they speak with, and their incentive structure and how they get paid and rewarded, they are always going to be pushing for more features and less of everything else. Right. So I know I'm in trouble when I'm with a company where that 50% slice, you know, turns out to be 30 because we took 50% and we gave it to the one-off crazy things that a few big customers want. That's the fastest way to put your company out of business or turn it into a professional services firm. So I love salespeople, they bring all the money in, but as product folks, we have to recognize what their biases or lenses or metrics are. Okay, let's do a couple more. Marketing, we love marketing. We know it's marketing because there's a package with a bunch of keywords on it and we've just added the keywords 
Bitcoin and machine learning because gosh, everybody's interested in that, right? Um, the marketing lens, and I'm particularly thinking of the lead gen side of marketing here is how do we get people to behave, right? Oh yes, um, Michaela reminds me blockchain is in there too, right? Can't have a VC pitch without blockchain and machine learning and Bitcoin, whatever, right? Um, the marketing folks are much more concerned with how do we get folks top of funnel? How do we get people who don't know our company to show up for a webinar or a white paper or a sales call, right? So their interest is how do we get folks um, to raise their hands not about features, not about the details, but the, the top line subject, right? Uh, and so we get, we get things like this. Our competitor supports Azure and we don't, or whatever that means, right? Or we threw a, an integration panel discussion about artificial intelligence and a lot of people showed up. So what can we do next month that'll get a lot of people to show up to another topic? Again, it's probably Bitcoin and blockchain. Right? It's not that marketing is wrong, it's that they're sampling at the top of the funnel. So who are they missing? They're missing current customers. They're missing customers who turned away. They're missing customers not in our segment. They're missing customers who never heard of us. Right? So sampling bias, right? let's keep going. Uh, support, and, and I love support teams because they, they have maybe the hardest job in the world. What's their lens? What's their bias? Well, all day long they're taking calls or slacks or emails or whatever version it is from current customers with current problems who are unhappy enough that they're going to spend time trying to report an issue. And their big metric, of course, is they want to drive down the number of tickets or outages or requests or whatever, right? Which is probably well aligned with the product folks, with, with us in engineering. But again, notice their sampling bias. Support doesn't talk with prospects who haven't bought yet. Support almost never talks with folks who disliked our product and walked away and canceled. Support doesn't talk with folks in geographies or markets that we're not selling into. So when we hear from support, we're going to hear again a different slice. We're going to hear about the tickets. We're going to hear about the you know, user level UX. We're going to hear about individual problems, which are, by the way, embarrassing. And when somebody calls the CEO and says, I couldn't log on to your system because your three-factor authentication doesn't work, you know, I get a call two seconds after that, right? But the support team tends to be focused on bugs and existing features and getting stuff that's already working or not working to work for current customers, right? We're going to fold this in in a sec, but just to finish the thought, right? Engineering, I don't know if this is your lead engineer, right? But our engineers are gonna sample a different way. They're much, much more sensitive to, much more aware of and feel the pain of the problem of building software. So they worry about tools and code check-ins and architecture and tech debt and scalability and you know how to reorganize the teams. And their metric turns out to be, unless we push them really hard, how do we help them make their job easier, build better, higher quality software faster, right? Which is Again, something I want as a product manager or head of product, but it can't be the only thing. If we gave the steering wheel over to engineering, we'd find out that suddenly 70% of our work is on tech debt and infrastructure and architecture, and 10% is on things that are going to bring money in, right? So, um, and here's what we hear, you know, fill in your own things, but it's generally in technical terms. So if you're non-technical, study up, right? But we have all these arguments about architecture and microservices and how to store our stuff in the database, which for the most part, customers don't care about unless we fail. So if we run out of capacity, of course, we failed. But nobody in the back can tell mostly how our APIs are constructed unless it's a partner kind of offering. OK, we've got a couple more of these. Our executives, I don't know if you work for this gentleman, but I have, right? So. First, let me say that I've been a CEO and it's the toughest job I ever failed at. It's really, really hard. And any of us who don't have deep sympathy and empathy for our CEOs, I think we're missing out on understanding how hard that job is. And one of the things that makes it hard is that the CEO gets beaten up and called and poked all day long by people who are unhappy. Investors who want us to make more money, big customers who want us to commit to a thing, um, 
you know, partners who aren't happy, uh, everybody in the company who's got a complaint. It's really easy in the CEO job to be ADHD and not to be able to figure out what you did in the last meeting because you're in 11 hours meeting every day. So when I see a lot of CEOs, a lot of executives, uh, I'll use the phrase recency bias here, right? They tend to generalize from the last complaint or the last call or the last big customer who is unhappy. And so we usually hear, we often hear from the CEOs, everybody wants X because they just got off a call where some really, some u- uniquely strange and different customer who's big and has their phone number ripped them a new one because we didn't have X and nobody has any idea what it is or who it's for, right? And the metric that they're usually following because uh, often their investors, our investors are polite enough to only call once a day each to ask how revenue is doing, right? So the bias is how do we make today's deal close? How do we hit our number for this quarter? Because I don't want to lay anybody off, right? So we hear Mercedes is a top five customer. Well, that's interesting, but the thing they're asking for makes no sense or is impossible or is going to undercut our product, right? I'm told this one is easy. It's usually the customer tells that to the sales team, who tells that to the sales VP, who tells that to the CEO, right? And again, it's really easy to generalize from very, very scarce data here. Everybody wants single sign-on. Well, actually, they don't. And so it falls to product folks t- to know what's true. All right. Have we gone through all our personalities here? Yeah. So a couple more things. Um, th- this is a picture I call the good idea train. And anybody in product knows that the good idea train pulls up in front of your email and Slack channel and text and every other inbound version you have at least once a day and unloads a thousand good ideas. Okay, 10,000, right? Everybody in the world feels the need to tell you what they want, right? And it comes from everybody and it's in volumes that are so high that we actually can't respond to them all. So for instance, I try to avoid having my product teams put some service level agreement up that says, we'll respond to every request within two days. Because gosh, within a week or three, that's all we're doing is we're reading requests, right? And then there's a little hint here in the quotes, Uh, often the go-to-market side has a very specific question for us. They say, explain to us how the prioritization process works. Now, we might hear that as, let me show you my algorithm and we have all these backlogs and we have tools, right? No, what they're really asking is, what form do I have to fill out or what step do I need to do or who do I have to escalate it to? So you will say yes to every request I give you, right? They're not asking a process question, they're asking a political question, right? How do I get all the things I want? Because clearly I didn't get all the things I wanted last week. Right? And so if you find yourself trying to explain in great details um, how you're weighting the 16 columns in your spreadsheet, you're missing the discussion. Right? This is about tell me that you're giving me what I want or tell me your boss's email so I can escalate. Right? And, and yes, uh, Dan had a good point. Take them out for a beer. We're going we're gonna to do that in a minute. Right? So really important that we, just to wrap up this thought, The idea that your stakeholders, your internal departmental stakeholders are going to agree and come into the meeting with a unified list. Well, I may have seen it once or twice in the last four decades, but it's pretty rare. So whenever I I see these sort of algorithmic tool things, they start with the assumption that we've ironed out all of the issues with our stakeholders and we have a list. And I keep pulling us back from that and saying, well, no, you don't because the the algorithms are the second half. Okay, we ready to keep going? All right, so let's look at that same pie chart. And now we've assigned players. So on on the green side, right? um, You've got all the folks who are thinking about the markets and the money, right? And so sales and marketing execs tend to over index on visible features, because that's all they see. And at least at the beginning of the quarter, they would like this whole pie to be green. Of course, if we do that, we're out of business in two quarters, right? On the, on the red side, we've got all the folks who really worry about infrastructure and quality and architecture. So that includes engineering and support and us as product managers. We're trying to defend that red slice from the encroaching green slice, right? The blue slice at the bottom, 
honestly, in a lot of companies, it's hard to find people who are willing to agree that we should do discovery or validation instead of building the one feature they know they want. Um, if anybody's heard the, the, the long story about how there's no health benefits to joining a gym, right? It turns out there's no health benefits to joining a gym unless you go to the gym and you work out and you sweat. And that's important here because if in you know August, we agree that just for August, we're going to not do any discovery because we have a couple of features that need to be built. Well, it turns out we've set up a behavior that in September, we're going to agree that just in September, we're going to not do any discovery because we have features we need to build. And we will have fallen down the rabbit hole of never doing discovery, right? And then, of course, at the top, I always, in an enterprise company, enterprise software, I'm trying to reserve a little bit of capacity, which we'll talk about in a moment, for the inevitable interrupts that come from the two or three biggest deals. They always happen. If we don't plan for them, we're always late. Uh, Andrew's got a question. If you had firm guidelines for dividing up the pie, what if engineering's not aligned? Well, I'm gonna tell you that no one's going to be aligned here. So, so this is an executive problem because every one of these groups wants a bigger slice. And as we've noted, you can't make all the slices bigger. Right. So we're going to have to have a discussion. And typically this is the VP of product or the CPO or somebody having a really serious discussion with a small number of execs around the table when there's not a really big issue that we're fighting over. This is at the beginning of the quarter or the year or the period when we're not emotional about some one thing and we can negotiate what this pie looks like. And it's different depending on strategy and it's different depending on where your products are, but vaguely, Ideally, it looks something like this. Okay, so why does this help us? Why is this good? Again, we're in the psychology space. I'm going to then suggest that what we do is we break up our stakeholders and we let them help us prioritize the different slices. So we know, for instance, that the support team would love us to spend 177% on fixing bugs, but we can't do that. So we're gonna have a slightly different discussion with support where we say on the product side, hey, here's my budget. Here's your budget, right? And again, I don't care what we measure it in, engineered days or lines of code or story points or strawberries, doesn't matter, right? But if we go to the, the head of support or some of the key folks in support and say, we're gonna fix every, every sprint, we're gonna fix two or three bugs or four, right? Depending on how big they are. But we're gonna let you help us prioritize which bugs we fix because you guys are on the front lines of taking bug calls. And we know that your metric is to reduce calls. So you're gonna be incented to pick the ones that come in the most often. And we're gonna be incented to fix the easiest ones. And so the intersection there is, they're gonna help us prioritize the bugs we fix, but not the features, right? And likewise, if we go down the list, uh, engineering really wants to spend all of its time on infrastructure and tech debt. We can't do that. We're out of business. But we can set a budget. We can negotiate with head of engineering to say, again, I don't know, care what the numbers are, right? But we're going to spend five developer days every sprint on each team or in each group or whatever it is doing things that, that engineering and product degree are going to help. And the metric isn't revenue. The metric is... Is it making developers' lives easier? And, and if you guys pick stupid things and it doesn't make your lives easier, shame on you, right? Because we need your help understanding what's going to make engineering go faster, right? Notice we've divided the problem first before we divide the audiences, right? Customer success. So these are folks onboarding new customers who are having trouble. They're inevitably going to be running into integration issues or blockers or training problems that are different from what the support team sees in later customers. And we are in deep, deep water if we can't onboard new customers quickly and if customer, customer success fails. So they're gonna have a few things and we're gonna make some space in maybe every sprint, maybe other sprint, I don't know, you figure it out, where the two things that make it most difficult for customer success to onboard customers are the ones we try to put at the top of our list. Notice what we've done here is we've outsourced some of the thinking we haven't outsourced, this, outsourced the decisions. We still get the last call, but by dividing the problem up and dividing the stakeholders up, we can put them in smaller boxes and get better answers. Now, this isn't perfect. Not everybody gets it. You know, Some organizations are gonna resist, but even if you don't take this method, notice 
we're addressing the people issues and the organizational issues first. Because in my view, if you leave those for last, you never get anywhere. Okay, one other tool that, that I like to use, and uh, there's a long post on my, on my site on this one. This is a very simple, narrow, it, it's actually a Kanban chart, but don't tell anybody because executives hate big words they don't understand. Um, it's, a, it's a very simple chart for what we're working on now and what's next and what's soon. And I always recommend with my product managers that we, back in the days when we were in an office, um, we would keep this printed out and in our pockets or in our notebooks at all moments. Because when somebody comes up to you and says, I need, I want, I need, I want, this is urgent, I have to have, the very first entry point is, well, that's really interesting. Instead of saying, that's a stupid idea, <laughs> we want to say, well, that's really interesting, that's, that, that, that's a, uh, attractive, but let's look at the three things that our end user app team is working on right now, which we told the board of directors we're doing and we've approved and we've crushed everything else out of the backlog for, is your thing more important than the three things in development? And the answer is almost always no. And so they say, well, I want my next. And so, well, before we actually go into development, we probably should do some feature definition and some architecture and whatever. Once the, the improved sign is ready, you know, where would you rate your stuff against the things that are queued up? And then if it doesn't land there, it ends up in validation. Right. So instead of being insulting, what we're doing is we're helping remind the people who can't remember what's on the roadmap, what we're working on, and then we're inviting them to notice that it's way more important than almost anything else. Right. Choose your, your technique. I don't care. But th this is a respectful way of telling somebody we're not going to do their thing without calling them stupid. So here's my little shaggy dog story. It's from a startup. Uh, I was there in 03, 04, 05, not that it matters. Uh, small company, maybe 60 people. I had marketing and product and business development, I think something else. But I, I made a really strong conscious effort to, to be a partner with my VP of sales, who's a brilliant guy and I love and I stay in touch with. And here's the deal that we set up. I said, Stuart, because that was his name, Stuart, um, I, we, we got a token. And, and in this case, it turned out to be an empty shell casing for, for a reason that you'll see in a moment. And I gave Stuart the empty shell casing and I told him to put it in his desk. And any time during the quarter, he could come to me and say, I'm ready to redeem my token. Uh, and the rule was he could have anything he wanted as long as it was one engineer week or less. Right? And, and uh, my engineering partners and I got to decide it was too big, but he could choose anything he wanted that was one engineer a week or less, and we would do it. And the, and the reasons that was important were, first of all, he was responsible, he is responsible for all the revenue of the company. So he's got incentives lined up for us to make the most money, not just to close one deal. The second thing was a win for me because every one of his sales reps would come to me you know, probably no more than twice or three times a week and say they needed something. And I could send them back to their boss, who, by the way, was on all the pipeline calls and knew which deals were big and which ones were going to close, and let him decide who was worthy. And the third thing that was really important was uh, the reason we had this little physical token was I took it from him and put it in my desk. And so in week two, he would decide what was most important in the quarter, and I would take the token away. In week four, he would reach into his desk drawer. It's gone. Right? And so this was a way of enforcing scarcity in a very physical, obvious way. Uh, we're friends, by the way. We, we go out for beer, right? Um, and it helped us align the sales team and the product engineering team instead of having everybody screaming for stuff, right? Because we relocated the trade-offs at the right level so he could make good decisions for the company and so could I. And we're still friends, so that must mean something. So here's my takeaways. Um, this is a phrase I've started using a lot in the last few years. I believe we as product managers have to be students of human behavior. Not enough to have spreadsheets, not enough to write user stories, not enough to do surveys. We really have to understand how our users think and how the folks in our company behave, because otherwise we're going to be very frustrated. Right? And that starts with understanding what the other folks in our company do, what their biases are, and what they're motivated by. Right? In the same way that we, if we want somebody to buy our product, we need to talk benefits, not features first. When we want to get somebody to agree on our prioritization or roadmap or pie slice, 
we have to understand where they're coming from, right? How they feel, how they think. Um, a hint for everybody, not everyone at your company thinks like an engineer or they'd be engineers, right? Okay, let's keep going. What other takeaways? Um, we've got to do this kind of explicit allocation or pie chart with the executive team when there's not a big deal pending. You got to find the moment when we can be rational and nobody's distracted by the fact that Goldman Sachs called up and told us if we could add teleportation to our product by Friday, they would buy it, right? So um, I find that, again, this is an executive level thing. Individual product managers probably can't push this forward, but they can sure lobby their boss to do it. All right, a couple more. Um, here's my phrase. I know that we push copies of the roadmap to everybody in the company at least once a week. Right, but most people are in the company aren't very interested in our roadmaps, and they forget what's on them. So rather than be offended, let's make sure that we send out you know the top line three three word or twenty word summary every single week to everybody, so they don't have to remember anything. Because again, if we if we expect everyone in the company to be as fascinated by our roadmaps as we are then we're not living in a real company. By the way, when you send out a link to some system of yours that keeps PDFs of roadmaps, almost nobody clicks on it. And when they do, they discover it's full of all these code names and version numbers, which nobody on the go-to-market side understands. So sending out a link to your, whatever your product management system is that has roadmaps is insufficient. You got to dumb it down and send out really simple stuff all the time. All right, keep going. Um, this is the hard one. So we as product folks know we live in the exclusive or world, not in the and world. And so within every one of these categories or slices or buckets, we have to push folks to prioritize and help us prioritize and make trade-offs. Because I don't know if you guys know this, but there aren't enough engineers at your company, at any company, right? We'll never get it all built. So we have to make hard choices. Last one, I think there's one more here, right? Um, so this is how we get folks to help. This is the Tom Sawyer, can we help paint your fence thing, right? Where by breaking it down into smaller groups, we can actually offload some of the work, right? I love it when the support team brings me back their top nine tickets and we're gonna choose four because I don't have to look at the other 870 that are stuck in the backlog and are never gonna come out, right? So, you know, when we bring people into the process in ways that let them help us trade off. We're happier, they're happier, we do less work and we actually make good decisions. So again, we have to think about how folks react and how they behave, not just the numbers of tickets. Okay, I'm gonna catch my breath here. This is how to find me and one of my two office managers, by the way. Hey, all right, Rich, thanks for a great talk. Um, oh, my pleasure.